In this video, we are going to look at just why Einstein turned to the Lorentz transformation in order to formulate the special theory of relativity. At the conclusion of part three of this series, Einstein had arrived at a significant conclusion. Einstein had concluded that the hypothesis that time is independent of the motion of the body of reference was not correct. He stated that time is relative and that every system of coordinates or reference body has its own particular time. He now goes on to question the validity of the last hypothesis on our list. This asserts that the length of a body remains the same no matter whether the body is still or is moving. He discusses this issue in section 10 of his book, published in 1916. I will pause very briefly to mention that whereas up until now we have used this book as the primary source for this series, going forward we will make increasing use of his original paper published in 1905. The paper was titled On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies. There are several open sources for this document. I will use the source displayed on this link. So returning to the issue of length, Einstein asks us to consider two particular points on the train traveling along the embankment with the velocity v and to inquire as to their distance apart. For convenience, we can say that the two particular points are the front and end of the train. So point B1 indicates the front of the train and point A1 indicates the end of the train. We now need to determine the distance between A1 and B1. Einstein provides the method. He tells us to use a measuring rod and mark off the number of times it takes to get from A1 to B1. For simplicity, we assume this will result in a whole number of times with no fractions. The number shown in the diagram is arbitrary. We now need to turn our attention to the embankment. Einstein defines two points A and B. The points A and B on the embankment, he says, are those points which are just being passed by the two points A1 and B1 at a particular time t, judged from the embankment. He means by this, of course, at any particular time. Next, we will measure the distance from A to B. Employing the same method, we measure the distance from A to B by repeated applications of the measuring rod along the embankment. We now look at the special case where time t is equal to zero. This is equivalent to the case where the train is still relative to the embankment. As you would expect, the distance from A1 to B1 equals the distance from A to B. Moving on from this special case where time t equals zero to various particular points in time where time t is increasingly greater than zero. There would appear to be no difference between the initial case where the time t is equal to zero, the train is still, and those cases where the train is moving with velocity v and the time t is increasingly greater than zero. The distance from a1 to b1 in all cases appears to be the same as the distance from a to b. In his original 1905 paper, Einstein confirms that this conclusion would fit with the scientific thought prevailing at that time. He says that the then current kinematics would have assumed that the lengths determined by measuring on the moving train 
and by measuring when the train was at rest, would be the same. But he goes on to prepare us to face a challenge to the validity of this assumption. He warns us that the length of the train, as measured from the embankment, may be different from that obtained by measuring in the train itself. At this stage in his book, Einstein does not spend time justifying this statement. Instead, he will give a detailed explanation later, as this series will do. But prior to that, he will first identify the source of the inconsistencies in our list of theories and hypotheses. He states that the apparent incompatibility of the law of propagation of light with the principle of relativity has come about because we assume the validity of these two unjustifiable hypotheses borrowed from classical mechanics. But, he says, if we drop these assumptions, then the possibility presents itself that the law of the propagation of light may be compatible with the principle of relativity. To pursue this possibility, he poses a question, the answer to which will lead to the formulation of the special theory of relativity. How are we to find the place and time of an event in relation to the train when we know the place and time of the event with respect to the railway embankment? He goes on to ask, is there a thinkable answer to this question that the law of transmission of light in vacuo does not contradict the principle of relativity? He turns this particular query into a more general question with regard to two coordinate systems, one still, the other in motion. So, in this diagram, if coordinate system K represents the embankment and coordinate system K1 represents the train, Einstein asks the question, what are the values X1, Y1, Z1, T1 of an event with respect to K1 when the magnitudes x, y, z, t of the same event with respect to K are given. If we had assumed the validity of the hypotheses that time and distance are independent of coordinate systems and their relative motion, then we would have answered Einstein's question using the Galilei transformation. This simple formula has the transformation between the x and x1 axes. Related to the velocity v multiplied by the time t, which equates to the relative distance travelled. While the values on the y and y1 axes are by definition equal, as are the values of z and z1. Regarding the transformation of time, the Galilean transformation assumes that the time values of t and t1 would be equal. But the Galilei transformation reflects the acceptance of the validity of the hypotheses that time and distance are independent of coordinate systems and their relative motion, while Einstein has denied their validity. On top of which, he provided a further stipulation that the Galilei transformation cannot logically satisfy. It is essential that the law of transmission of light in vacuo does not contradict the principle of relativity. In other words, the constancy of the speed of light in a vacuum must be preserved. There is a quite straightforward reason why the Galilei transformation cannot meet this stipulation. This is because the transformation rule on the x-axis does not place any limit on the velocity v. It allows velocity v to be any value and thus presents the possibility that v could exceed the constant speed of light in a vacuum. 
Einstein is therefore left to invent or look for a different transformation, one that allows for time to be relative and does not allow the constant velocity of light in a vacuum to be exceeded. In fact, such a transformation already existed. It was the Lorentz transformation. This diagram is an image taken directly from Einstein's book. How did it come about that this transformation already existed? And how did it limit velocity to the speed of the propagation of light? We will go into the very interesting history behind the Lorentz transformation in the next video. We will also work through some specific examples to see how the Lorentz transformation differs from the Galilei transformation. But for now, we will briefly examine just how the Lorentz transformation satisfies Einstein's criteria. The Lorentz transformation limits any velocity to the velocity of light by applying this limiting factor. It is employed in both the transformation of the x-axis and the time axis. And it is the underscored component that provides the limit. A cursory examination shows that if v is greater than c, then the square root is of a negative number and hence gives an imaginary number. And if v is equal to c, then the square root is of zero which results in a zero divide. Einstein supplies the fundamental conclusion that in the theory of relativity, the velocity c plays the part of a limiting velocity, which can neither be reached nor exceeded by any real body. So the theory of relativity will no longer use the Galilei transformation and will discard the classical hypotheses regarding time and distance. Instead, the theory of relativity will use the Lorentz transformation to provide a solution that ensures that the law of transmission of light in vacuo does not contradict the principle of relativity. The ramifications of the use of the Lorentz transformation would be profound. They include time dilation, length contraction, and the increase of mass, all of which we will cover in this series. In our next video, we will go into the history and scientific background leading up to the development of the Lorentz transformation. We will also more closely examine the transformation formulas.